It is my pleasure to introduce our luncheon speaker, Dr. Mustafa Gopchek, and I'm sorry if I massacred your name. Dr. Mustafa Gopchek is an associate professor of history at Niagara University in Niagara Falls, New York. He received his BA and MA degrees in international relations at Bilkent University, Ankara, Turkey. Dr. Gokchek studied Russian language in Moscow and then pursued his PhD in history at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. His dissertation focused on Muslim intellectuals from Russia who migrated to Istanbul in early 20th century and actively engaged in the intellectual discussion on Islam and Turkish nationalism. His research interest uh, includes contemporary social movements in Muslim societies. Dr. Gokches currently teaches courses on the history of the Ottoman Empire, the Middle East, Russia, and Central Asia. He is also the director of master's program in interdisciplinary studies at Niagara University. Dr. Gokche is going to share his thoughts on Turkey and he's going to specifically focus on where Turkey is heading towards and the title of his uh, talk is Between Russia and the Middle East Challenges for Turkey. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mustafa Gokche. Thank you, Dr. Um, Muhammad Ilahi, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you um, for organizing this great uh, event, a day full of intellectual uh, stimulating activities, thought provoking uh, panels. It is a pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the Department of International Business and also the Academy of International Business, the U.S. Northeast Chapter as well as the Peace Islands Institute for their cooperation in putting this panel together and having me here. <clears throat> well, um, in my talk I will be addressing Turkey in its relationships uh, with Russia and the Middle East. We tend uh, not to see those connections all the time very well, um, but I hope my talk will uh, bring out some of those and put it in uh, a larger context. Uh, it is going to be a different style, so I hope you will uh, bear with me. Whenever I tell a Turkish guy that I study Russian-Ottoman relations, the first question is this. Did Baltaja Mehmet Pasha let the encircled army of Peter the Great in 1711 at Prut go untouched because of Yekaterina? Well, and the scene is depicted sort of in this painting. I don't know what Baltaj Mehmet Pasha did inside the tent with Yekaterina since I wasn't there, but I'm glad that at least his name was not Mustafa because there are enough Mustafas who are troublemakers in Turkish history <laughs> and we don't need another one. Turkish-Russian relations in history, as a historian I have to address these historical ties, are not always remembered with friendly exchanges. As I was preparing to make my first journey to Russia on an educational exchange program in 2000, the consular at the Russian embassy in Ankara proudly told me that out of the 22 wars Russia had with Turks, the Russians won 21 of them. It might very well be true depending on which battles you count. However, Turks may get credit for the two centuries long Golden Horde rule over Russia, which may be the very reason for the emergence of a unified Russian Empire. My own research on the critical role of Kazan Tatars in promoting Turkish nationalism in the late Ottoman Empire indicates the extent of the Turkish-Russian relations much beyond the battlefields, especially the mutual inspirations between the Soviet Union and the Turkish Republic in their formative years are in dire need of scholarly attention. It is after the dissolution of the Soviet Union that we talk about concrete engagements between these two nations. On the economic side, suitcase trade, which, is, which was often called bavul tijareti, 
sparked movements of goods and people between the two countries. As Russians were enchanted with the intoxicating lure of the shopping malls, Turkish corporations found opportunities for chain stores and major construction projects in Russia. Government pipeline projects of Blue Stream, South Stream and the Turkish Stream tell us that the potential of the Turkish-Russian cooperation may have a greater future than we can think of. More importantly, Russia and Turkey found in each other an alternative to Western economic dependence. After all, both countries are both European and not at the same time. They both want to be engaged in European organizations, but both are too proud to be told to be more democratic. And from the Western perspective, Russia cannot be really European for obvious reasons, and Turkey also cannot be truly European for, well, other obvious reasons. Looking at Turkey's role in Russia and the Middle East, we definitely and surprisingly observe some common elements. Turkey is popular both in Russia and the Middle East for its kebabs, baklavas, as we have had, and yogurt, obviously, but also for its beaches. For both Russians and Arabs, Turkey is Western enough, capitalist enough, affordable enough, and most importantly, close enough to have a good vacation. For Russian women, Turks make strong family men, and for Arab men, Turkish women are Islamically attractive. Although Russian tourists know Antalya better than Turkey itself, you should see the Arab sheikhs in their 15 passenger vans flocking for hot springs. In both regions, Turkish textile is pretty popular, but for different kinds. Russians love the Turkish leather coats, and the Arab women love shopping for Turkish style lingerie in fashionable hijab stores. I already mentioned the Turkish construction companies. They build seven star hotels in Dubai and every size of shopping malls in Russia, but still they contribute to the rise of capitalist taste equally among the Arabs who have and the Russians who have not. I have to mention the Turkish soap operas. They are insanely popular in all over the Middle East. The shows Nur, at least until they were banned in some countries. The shows Nur and Sanawatu Dai are as popular as the Super Bowl games in the US. So much so that the Saudi Grand Mufti issued a fatwa that only God's enemies watched them. <laughs> because a lot of women were seeking divorce after watching these. A cab driver in Egypt was passionately describing to me how infidel Turkey was, and when I asked him how he knew, he told me that it was these Turkish TV shows he watches every week. <laughs> Common images of Turkey from both the Russian and Middle Eastern side is not confined to the few cultural elements. For the Russians, Constantinople represents the once holy city where the head of the Orthodox Church sat until the infidel Turks conquered it. For the Muslims of the Middle East, Istanbul was the seat of the Caliphate until infidel Ataturk took it. Well, nobody really talks about any dreams of reviving neither. Another element Turkey has to offer in both regions is the Turkish schools of the Hizmet movement. Hizmet schools, now officially in over 160 countries, have been popular among the Russian people and the Hizmet institutions have been quite appealing among the Muslim scholars in the Middle East. However, these global-minded schools suffer setbacks under certain authoritarian regimes. Both in Russia and the Middle East, the governments seem to be concerned about these schools' export of Turkish identity. Ironically, as Turkey gets more authoritarian, the government is concerned about Hizmet's betrayal of the Turkish identity. Supposedly, Hizmet-related police and prosecutors caught Erdogan red-handed, channeling billions of dollars to his cronies and family projects. As a result, the Hizmet movement's leader, Fethullah Gülen, we were supposed to have a picture of him there, um, who resides in Pennsylvania, was already declared by Erdogan-controlled media a talented spy who managed to work both for CIA and Mossad and a trader aiming to conduct a Sharia takeover in Turkey all at the same time. The latest revelation a couple days ago 
was his decades-long membership with Freemasons. And today, Erdogan's media published documents showing how he informed on other Islamic communities to his friends among Turkish military coup makers in 1971, but we didn't read about how Gudan still served jail time during the coup. We couldn't read about it on, on the newspapers online because power was lost in entire Turkey a couple days ago, and we have no idea if it was a terrorist attack or if there were cats going into power stations. Because <laughs> this was the suggestion by the Minister of en Energy uh, who was trying to explain the power outages during the elections last summer, that there were cats going into these electric <coughs> truffles. And, these are, and it exploded Twitter. You can imagine uh, the Turkish creativity as exemplified in these. This guy says, I'm going to the uh, electricity uh, power station guys, uh, saying his last prayers. I know you expect me to talk about more serious issues. Is Turkey becoming neo-Ottoman, or is the forecast of Turkey as a model for Middle East completely dead? Is Sultan Erdogan going to declare himself as the next caliph, or is his primary inspiration Putin? Do Turkish elections resemble more the ones in Syria or the ones in Russia, if there is a difference between the two? Where do you have more journalists in prison, Russia, Turkey, or Syria? Among the Turkish journalists in prison, one of them, Hidayat Karaja, all the way to the right, who is the head of the Hizmet-affiliated TV channels, is jailed because of a soap opera that mentioned the police raid against a terrorist organization. Another journalist, Mehmet Baransu, in the middle, is in jail for publishing state secrets, documents that show an army plot for a coup against Erdogan, and old enemies have become friends now. Well, in Turkey, at least, they are not found dead with plutonium in their blood, like Alexander Litvinenko was, at least, not yet the one on the top. But Erdogan might gain that capability of plutonium once the nuclear plants are built under the Russian supervision. If there is one big resemblance between the political systems of Russia and Turkey, that is how confused our Western scholars are in identifying the level of their democracy or lack thereof. Political scientists keep coming up with fancy terms and call them so many names, electoral democracies, semi-democracies, illiberal democracies, tutelary democracies, hybrid regimes, this somebody not using democracy, electoral authoritarianism, quasi-democracies, defective democracies, and so on. Well, historians will rather find resemblances to Tsar Nikolai II and Sultan Abdulhamid II. I guess any one of these concepts still put both Russia and Turkey in a better position compared to the Middle Eastern countries, which rapidly go through the seasons from spring to fall and a seemingly endless winter. Davutoglu's idealistic foreign policy of zero problems with neighbors ended in zero neighbors and too many problems following the so-called Arab Spring. Erdogan continued to pursue a blind idealism and became completely blinded to the realities in Egypt, Syria, and Iraq. Today, Turkish ship shipments to Middle East cannot go through Syria or Iraq, and the only remaining gateway into the Middle East, the Egyptian ports, are blocked due to the Turkish government's denial of the Sisi regime. For a decade, Erdogan's government worked to build close ties with Iran, even sacrificing its ties with the West, and now they have to acknowledge the aggressive Iranian policies in Yemen, Iraq, and Syria. The outwardly hysterical bashings of Israel gives a lot of points to Erdogan among the conservative masses of Turkey, as well as the Arab street. However, Turkey's credible position as the primary mediator between Arabs and Israel has flown away for the foreseeable future like the shisha smoke disappearing into the sky forever. On that issue too, Erdogan and Putin are once more side by side in declaring their support for the Palestinian state, while Turkey still allows shipment of northern Iraqi oil to Israel through Turkish ports. I know you expected me to address this issue in a more seriously academic way, but talking about how authoritarian Turkey is after a while just gets boring. 
As regimes get more authoritarian, it makes more sense to use sarcasm and satire because that remains as the only way to make sense of a senseless situation. That is why in Turkey today, the number and circulation of satire magazines increase every day. And that's also why Twitter has been the primary medium in which frustrated millions share their one-liners with others. My fifth grader's son told me last night, as I was going through these notes, that, quote, you guys, that is you, should not post any of this on Twitter, otherwise I'll be in trouble when I go to Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> and him and I didn't know that this would be recorded. <laughs> At least I enjoyed preparing for this talk much better, and I hope you enjoyed listening as much as I did. Thank you. Time for any questions and discussion, I assume. Yes. I'm always interested in really hearing from the people who are on the ground. What, do you, what is the sense of the Turkish people within Turkey? I know you've given an impression that there's a lot of frustration, um, but they don't know what to do. So, so what's the plan going forward um, for those people to see a change, or is the majority happy with what's taking place? Because Ardogan has been elected the second time in the presidency. So what do we make out of that? For the presidency, first time, but he won all the elections that he has gone into uh, in the last 10, 12 years. So it is a big puzzle. And there is really no strict like majority opinion on how come he wins all these elections. There is clearly a major group of people who support him for various reasons we can discuss. Um, but he wins the elections how? Uh, some give it to the cats, as I mentioned. So some believe that there is serious uh, electoral uh, manipulations through various ways. I personally don't believe that it is that serious to, I mean, even if there are some, it is not as serious to change the balance from, let's say, 40% to 50%. I mean, in the last election presidential, he got 52%. It would be really a very big uh, scam to be able to pull that out for 10% you know, like change or anything. So uh, that's not my opinion. But there are some who, who really believe that that is the case. There are some others who, well, those who support, support for their own reasons. Uh, the latest polls, I think, show the AKP at around 40%, uh, slightly over 40. I haven't seen anything that's really making a big case for less than 40. So it is still a great majority. Uh, the only hope for the opposition is the possibility of uh, IKP not getting the uh, single party uh, majority. Uh, if they get less than 40%, maybe there will be a chance for a, a coalition government. Uh, so it is, it is still strong. Uh, it, it's interesting that with the Erdogan party and uh, the resistance to him, the opposition to him, uh, seem to be though united in the opposition to the Kurds. With the, what's going on in Syria and northern Iraq, um, why why has Turkey resisted? You know, for example, U.S. supplying of the Kurds against ISIS. Yes, that's a good question. Um, I mean, for that specific case, um, yeah, it is, I guess the, the official explanation was that uh, the Kurds in northern Syria, uh, they equated them with PKK. Uh, so it's similar to, it. basically they said it's exactly the same thing. ISIS and the Kurds in northern Syria are no different, they're all terrorists. Uh, eventually, they had to agree to uh, the northern Iraqi Kurds bringing in their men into northern Syria uh, over the Turkish lands. So that's what the Turkish government agreed to after a minor uprising of Kurds in Turkey. Um, the Kurdish policy of AKP is uh, quite interesting. Um, there seems to be some kind of a deal between uh, the two parties, that is the Kurdish movement, nationalist movement, and the AKP government. Uh, what is called the this solution process, um, 
where there is practically more or less an armistice, almost like a ceasefire between the two sides. Uh, no major military campaigns, although there are still some minor attacks here and there, and which seems to be working for both sides. AKP makes points that it stopped terrorism, and for the Kurdish side, they are making some progress uh, in terms of polit polit politics, political rights, but also the terrorist organization is able to recruit and, and raise funds and regroup uh, freely. So the, the group, the armed group, is not touched, is intact, and it is actually stronger. Um, those who are in opposition to AKP claim that some of the cities in Southeast Turkey are basically practically given to uh, the Kurdish separatists. There is no government, there is no state authority power in a few cities in Southeast Turkey. Um, so that is actually one of the areas where AKP makes uh, the biggest uh, strides with getting popular vote. And if this thing, because it is still a shaky agreement between the two sides, if this thing turns around and it becomes ugly, and if you end up seeing Kurdish uh, disturbances in major cities, that would be one of the uh, areas where AKP would lose the most of the popular support. Yeah, No, that's okay, please. Uh, uh, the, the issue in Turkey, for him, is remember, he's, he's a dictator. So he feels very powerful, and for him to be able to keep surviving as a dictator, he has to win the next election, which is in June 7. No matter what he does, he has to win it. Otherwise, he's gone. As soon as he loses the majority of the vote and the parliament, he's gone. He knows that he'll put in jail, because he's done so many unlawful things is unbelievable so what he has to do he has to play the politician's role so there is still minority of group in turkey and so on the way that they are looking at it, it's not a kurdish problem it's a pkk problem which is a terrorist organization or state department one, marxist Leninist terrorist organization so the way that they are looking at it they are not representing the majority of the kurds but they are trying to make an agreement so from the erdogan's perspective hey those guys that are fighting against ISIS in northern Syria, they are part of this PKK. So he was playing the domestic political situation, trying to gain the voice of, you know, the voice of the, those uh, patriotic Turks or whatever it is, to write this ones. But what happened is here, our government, US government, tell them just shut up, you need to open it up. Typical dictator, and then he shut up, they open up the floor of the arms supplies going to the those Kurds that are fighting against ISIS, which is the right thing to do personally. So he's, he plays the game. He's afraid, but he doesn't have to show his fear to the public, especially from those going back, all those type of things. So he's playing that game, and he's going to keep playing as long as he is there. Yes. I have a question. Turkey has been trying to enter the European Union for a long period of time. And under different pretexts, the European Union never accepted Turkey. And now the talk uh, is stalled. It has been stalled for the last three or four years. Do you foresee any possibility that Turkey will become a member of the EU? Yes. <laughs> is the short answer. Uh, but when, we don't know. I see the possibility, uh, but in probably uh, quite a long term, probably not in the next decade. Um, because uh, the question is not this government or that government. There are deeper issues, uh, as I just alluded to very uh, broadly, um, how the Western perspective does not really view Turkey as uh, innately, essentially a part of Europe, and uh, how uh, the Turkish governments are usually too proud to uh, fit within the confines of the European laws and regulations and demands. Um, so there are issues, the way I see it, on both sides. There is a lot of double standard applied by European Union, which is basically a pretext 
uh, to cover up the other cultural uh, reasons uh, deep beneath. And then on the Turkish side, there is a lot more to be done to uh, make Turkey a better democracy, uh, where there are, there's real separation of powers. There are major challenges in Turkish democracy in terms of political party uh, structures. Uh, these are not unique to today's government, uh, but they are ingrained within the Turkish political system. So there needs to be some serious reforms before Turkey can become a viable, stable uh, democracy. And uh, the last few years hasn't helped, to be honest. In the beginning, the AKP government did a lot in the first few years to speed up the process. Uh, and I think at least in that early period, partly due to a motivation to address the military tutelage in Turkey. Uh, the government uh, made a concerted effort to, to speed up the process and bring Turkey closer to the European Union. Uh, but over time, both the, uh, the rise of conservatism in Europe and the changing conditions in Turkey uh, made it quite difficult now. Do you think Turkey might turn to Russia in an attempt to force the European Union's hand? Well, it does already. <coughs> and it did uh, the, the earlier years too. The foreign policy that I mentioned, Davutoglu brought up zero problems with neighbors. It, it was really, the way I look at it is, it is really a great idea on paper. It is great, you know, having good relations with all the neighbors, resolving all the problems and developing ties with every country. That is when new Ottomanism came up. People thought, why is Turkey now interested in the Middle East? Why is Turkey now interested in the Balkans? Are they trying to revive? I think it was actually more than that. Maybe they had some ideas of you know, becoming like the Ottomans, but they also increased ties with Africa and, and Asia, etc., and removed visas, for example, with many countries to ease the exchange you know, of goods and a lot of projects with Russia, but at the same time with uh, the Turkic republics, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, which Russia is not always very pleased about. Mm -hmm. um, so the relations with Russia has been uh, both providing these, coming up with these opportunities with new projects, so both sides are pleased, but at the same time, Turkey is seeking other relationships, strengthening ties, for example, uh, placing the NATO missiles, uh, the defense shield in Malatya in eastern Turkey was something that Russia was quite upset about uh, as well. So uh, it is not a, a one direction, you know, always in the good, a strategic alliance where two sides are just getting close to each other, but it is diverse uh, kind of relationships. But especially after getting removed from the European Union or reducing the relations with the European Union, I think that has been a closer uh, development of relations, not just with Russia, but with other, like China, for example. There has been a recent issue about, uh, per, uh, was it purchasing missiles or developing a nuclear plant in Turkey together with China? And it created a huge tension with the Western uh, countries because it, it involves some military equipment and the NATO said, no, we can't do that. Uh, so I think the government is trying to diversify its the economic ties uh, in a way that it would benefit Turkey in the long run. But at the same time, it has a payoff in terms of Turkey's strategic relations with the West. The ties with Iran, for example. I mentioned briefly during the sanctions, Turkey just back-channeled a lot of billions of dollars. Actually, that's one of the reasons of the corruption cases that came up in Turkey. Uh, because during that illegal back-channeling, there was a lot of people who benefited from that. And, uh, and it back basically caused a lot of the credibility of Turkey in the West. Uh, then it's a choice. What is more important? Right? What is your foreign policy priority? Where do you want to stay close with? Do you want to keep your alliance with the West? With the, you know, that's what we see in Syria as well, in, in the Arab Spring. Uh, I think the government... There is definitely a lot of this hyped up self-image of seeing Turkey as a regional power and even a global power, who knows, you know, why not? Uh, but when you look at the reality, the end game, what you can really change, what is your real power on, on the ground, 
that is where the Arab Spring hit hard uh, Turkey's position. I have a question. As a historian, when do you think, 5, 10, 20 years, whatever it is, if Turkey will have a European type of democracy? I can answer that question myself. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, well, as a historian, I look back at the history, not the. <laughs> yeah, it is. It would be, I think, mistaken to give any specific years. It is just uh, developing these institutions. I think uh, in the first panel, uh, Dr. Kinani made that point. Developing these institutions, making sure the rule of law is in place, which is not, which is not something that can be done overnight. And actually, in the past few years, that's what we have seen. That's about more about mentality, right? It's not just about having the law sit there. It's a major improvement if you have the laws passed, but then you might still have the law and nothing in practice. You need to have the people educated enough, who have a global vision, who have global experience, uh, who, who have the taste of freedom. That's what I actually call that. Because um, an experience that I had in Egypt, I was sitting with my Arabic teacher and and he was telling me all these beautiful regimes, this was before the Arab Spring, beautiful regimes all across the Middle East. To me, it was all authoritarian regimes, right? Uh, autocrats, really, single-handedly. For him, it was, there was one republic, there was the kingdom, there was this, there was that. I was so amazed, how can you be so proudly talking? I said, what about democracy, isn't it better? He said. Yeah, it's another regime type, why not? But you know, we are happy with it. Maybe it is true that you know, having stability is better than civil war, but uh, also what I recognize, what I realized at that moment is that not seeing, not having that experience of democracy, that feeling of freedom, feeling of freedom of expression, that you can speak your mind freely, that is a major, uh, uh, like absence that you cannot uh, make up with anything else. And that is what actually that was made in a, a point in, in the earlier panel too, that the Arab Spring actually gave the people that taste of freedom, that the possibility that this can be done. And I hope in Turkey there will be a day when the majority of people will actually ask for more rights and more democracy, not just voting. The point that was made that a lot of people perceive as the right to vote or having that voting mechanism is enough to have democracy. Actually, that is what we are suffering with in Turkey right now because the for the government, anything they do is justified because they have the majority. So they can do anything they want and it's going to be dem democratic. And if you oppose that, you're actually applying double standards. You're not dem truly democratic because they win the elections. So that is when the example, other examples such as Germany before World War II comes in. Uh, Anyways. Yeah, I wanted to go back to your point of satire and how people are, you know, and, and Turks strike me as people with a very good sense of humor, and, and you're a good representation of that. Um, and, you know, it reminded me of Bassem Yosef, uh, an Egyptian John Stewart, I mean, who became very you know, well known when he appeared on, on the show. And I was thinking about how John Stewart, you know, in some of those political satire shows, Stephen Colbert, um, became so powerful in America that they were able to mobilize um, this, this movement that um, helped elect President Obama. Um, and then Bassem uh, Yosef, uh, Egyptian John Stewart, when uh, he started that, recreated that move, he was actually very successful in Egypt for a while, and then the government cracked down. Um, and actually, one of my friends is making a documentary about him, and I'm looking forward to, to seeing it. Um, what is the uh, political culture in terms of satire in Turkey? Do you think any potential? Um, in, in Turkey of something like, uh, like John Stewart, Stephen Colbert type movements that will actually mobilize um, people toward some you know, extensive <coughs> form. And, is, and you mentioned that Twitter is exploding right now. Are people, is the government cracking down on that too, the way it is in, in Egypt? Uh, the use of satire is expanding, but I think it is not at the level that it would create a popular movement yet. Uh, Twitter is probably more effective in that sense. Facebook and Twitter, they are both used very widely um, among certain portions of the population. Okay. Uh, Facebook is used more for certain reasons. 
family connections, you know, your own friend circles. Twitter is more for you know, getting the news, following what others think, etc. So it's used for different purposes and for political purposes, Twitter works more effectively. Uh, what happened before the elections in March, there was some effort by the government to uh, restrict social media. There was a ban on YouTube, there was a ban on Twitter for a while. After the elections, they were uh, eased and everything. Uh, still, there has been some laws that are passed which give the government the ability to shut down any internet content. It, that is still a judicial process, but at least they have the ability to block anything uh, immediately, uh, at least for a certain period of time, for a few days at least. So, um, the use of Twitter is powerful, but I think there is also, we need to consider the social dynamics, why the AKP is getting the support that it gets. Okay. What is the base, the popular base of AKP? And when we look at the popular base, that is something that uh, I noticed after the elections actually that came up uh, more importantly, uh, that people in Turkey, most people do not really read much. So when you look at the newspapers, the pro-government and anti-government, let's say, newspapers, and put their circulation numbers and add them up, it looks like actually the anti-government ones sell more. But when you look at the elections, it doesn't really come up that way. Why? Because a lot of people, most people just watch the TV. And when you look at the TV, actually there is a lot more, the way I see it at least, uh, maybe there needs to be some statistical data on this, uh, that there is more government, pro-government control over the TV. Uh, and then you can of course choose which channel you want to watch, right? The pro-government one, which makes you feel good, or if you're anti-government, you're watching the anti-government one, makes you feel good. So uh, people make their choices. Um, but there are other dynamics, identity issues, economic aspect, that, that make people keep voting uh, for AKP, although the, which this results in a greater polarization. More and more people, certain people are entrenched in their uh, pro-government identity, and more and more, increasingly, half, the other half of the population are entrenched in their anti-government position. And actually, the current status quo works to the hands of the government, so they are happy with that polarization. We don't really see a major effort to reduce that polarization, unfortunately. And the election times don't help. Yes. Let's see. Uh, during your talk, which I very much enjoyed, you mentioned a number of uh, economic connections that Turkey has made over the last 10, 15 years with various neighbors and, and countries further afield. And since money talks or money attracts, uh, where do you think, at the moment, on the balance, those trade connections are, are pulling Turkey? Are they being pulled toward <coughs> Russia? Is it south to the Middle East, west, east, far east, China? Well, as I said, I think uh, the overall policy, economically, and in terms of foreign policy, foreign economic policy of, of the Turkish government has been to diversify its connections. So. Uh, we don't necessarily see an increase in economic relations with the West, but I don't really see it as seriously diminishing as well. Uh, there is definitely a major increase of involvement with the Middle East, attracting a lot of uh, oil-rich countries' money into Turkey, uh, Dubai, Kuwait, Saudi, uh, but yes, there is, there is a visible increase in Arab presence, both of uh, tourists and maybe certain business uh, investments. But it is, again, not a dominating presence, I would say. Uh, well, Chinese dominate everywhere, not just Turkey. Uh, so in that sense, I don't know. I'm not the expert on that field, so I don't want to make any specific statements. But uh, I don't really see a, a strong pull to any direction at the point. Uh, it is more Turkey's uh, geographic position. Well, we should give some credit to also the private enterprise. Uh, it is not just the government, but the private businesses have also used opportunities in many other countries. Well, the way I look at it, I also see the rise of Turkish economy partially due to the Hizmet movement's connections 
This is not something that is often mentioned in the mainstream uh, studies on Turkey, but uh, Hizmet did not just open schools, but it established connections with 100 and more than 160 countries. When you have people there who speak Turkish, who can greet you at the airport, who can introduce you to the local businessmen or officials, that provides opportunities for businessmen. And, and Hizmet did not just send teachers into those schools, but they also sent businessmen to make investments in those countries. So, uh, so I think at least part of the current Turkish economic uh, if we can still talk of a success, uh, part of the credit should be given to those Hizmet connections, which the government also uh, supported, at least in the first uh, half, more than half of its, uh, its term. Yes. What is the effect of uh, the influx of refugees from Syria, estimates as many as a million, mm -hmm. on Turkey, and is there any possibility that their status could shift uh, if the political winds were to allow from refugee to immigrant? Yes, that's a very good question, important aspect, and it is actually making a major impact on Turkey that is not visible much from outside, and even Turkey, it is not much of a discussion. We don't really see policies developing about it. We don't really see much, uh, at least, official action being done in terms of accommodating. There has been the camps that are well taken care of, but from the camps to the street, how did people move? Uh, I don't think there was much direction, control, or guidance that could have been given. That could have given Turkey a huge advantage, actually. This human catastrophe could be turned into a great gain for Turkey, Turkey human capital. But unfortunately, I think that's a huge missed opportunity for Turkey. What we now end up having in our hands is uh, hundreds of thousands in Istanbul. Now, where are you going to go? And you're going from a small town. Well, everyone is in Istanbul, so you want to go to Istanbul as well. So now you have, uh, I think the estimate is put more than a million, maybe close to a million and a half uh, Syrian refugees in Turkey. So in Istanbul and in some southern cities, especially Gaziantep. And these cities, especially the smaller cities, suffer a lot from uh, uh, this situation where people look for the housing problem, the employment issues, uh, social issues, uh, the status of women, families, kids. So all sorts of problems are in place. And uh, in my mind, I give the credit here to the Turkish people in general. Uh, one of the things that many people mention, those who go to Turkey, is the Turkish hospitality. Although, um, Dealing with the refugees, we did hear about some uh, instances where there has been fights, uh, problems between groups, Turkish Syrian, and some resentment. But if this issue has not turned into a major social crisis, I think it is thanks to the support that Turkish people gave to these refugees in general. There has been a lot of uh, people just opening up their homes, they have an extra, like they would rent, they would just not get rent, uh, they would provide jobs. Uh, so there has been a lot of support that is given at the social uh, level by the Turkish people in this process. And in the future, yes, I really don't see them, most of them going back. Even if the situation gets better in the near future, which doesn't seem likely, uh, I really think that most of them will stay end up staying in Turkey because they have already started, most of them started their life in Turkey. They ended up having a house, living, starting living somewhere and having a job. And the kids going and the hospitals, you know, free healthcare and things like that. So they have now adopted more or less to the life in Turkey, which is definitely going to be much better than whatever they will go back to. Uh, so, uh, so yes, in the near future, we will see this uh, Syrian uh, or uh, past Syrian Arabs, now uh, Arab Turks, Syrian Turks in Turkey. Yes. Yes. Um, I just came back from a conference, and we were talking about social media. And right now, the general public is much better at social media than government. 
But do you see that changing at any time in the near future where governments will start to use social media to their benefit? What do you mean specifically when governments using uh, social media? Well, you see a lot of the controversy and conflicts against governments <coughs> have come about through social media. And governments don't seem to be adopting social media very rapidly. And so at some point, government is going to realize that they could use social media to their benefit. Do you see that happening anytime soon? Actually, it did happen in Turkey. It's a very interesting transformation of Erdogan himself, because in the beginning, uh, like when Abdullah Gül was the president, he would use the social media. Uh, and Erdogan actually made some comments that he didn't believe in the social media, that it just didn't make sense, nobody would use that, he made some specific comments against it. But then, I think at some point, once he realized that it is making a real difference, a major power, then he adopted it. Although, I don't think he still uses it himself, but people around him use it actively. And also, before the elections in past March uh, last year, he, uh, I think the AKP organized very well, very effectively in the social media, activating their members, their party organizations. That's one of the strengths of AKP. And Erdogan, with his political past, you know, he knows how a political party can organize among the people very well. So these local organizations, they organize very well and they uh, had their own presence in Twitter and, and Facebook uh, very strongly. So you have both sides heard on the social media. And it is still, to a certain extent, not as active as it used to be before the elections, but still you can find a lot of pro-AKP voice uh, coming out in social media as well. That's one of the other reasons why the party still holds strong. We have time for just one more question. I think there was a question. I don't know if you... Okay. Were you referring to in Turkey only or around the world? I was talking more around the world, okay, then not I want, just in then Turkey. I'd like to share with you a uh, uh, good example which just happened in the recently. Actually, end of last year, Taiwan has a, a general re-election. And uh, the ruling, ruling party is a KMT from Chiang Kai-shek, if you know, you know, you know re retreat from China, right? You know, defeated by the Communist Party, uh, and went to went to Taiwan. So they have been ruling, except uh, there was eight years, two terms by another party called DPP. Then, then end of last year, actually last year was a you know general general election, and uh, the younger people they use uh, internet, social media, mm -hmm. to actually form you know a very powerful uh, census and influence. But government refused to adopt those. They even gave, gave them a very funny, you know, nickname. Okay. However, the capital city, Taipei, um, Taipei was supposed to be the stronghold of uh, the ruling party, and also the son of you know previous chair of KMT was nominated to be the candidate, and the the, the DPP the actually the second part in, the, in that country or that island, they didn't have a uh, strong enough candidate to fight with. Okay? And at the time, there was another funny thing happened in the best hospital in Taiwan, National Taiwan University Hospital, also in Taipei, the capital city. The director of the emergency room, this gentleman, he was persecuted by something and he got very frustrated. He said, if government like this, I wanted to solve, you know, fix the problem myself. And he never been in any you know, political position at all. But then what happened is you know, those uh, young people, they wanted, to, they wanted to fight for so-called social justice, righteousness, etc. Through the social media support him, and he won the election. He is now the, ma the, the mayor. And what he did was this, you know, <coughs> the first day he became the, uh, the, the, the mayor, he start implementing social media and requesting all the, all the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the government officer in Taipei you know, municipal government to use that. And actually, <laughs> they use things called LINE. Yeah. He used LINE to do you know, all kind of uh, com communication and become commanding center. So a lot of you know, uh, problems happened, including there was an airplane crash. 
not too long ago. They use those to make you know, the uh, tax action within such a short time, which you know, actually shame the central government. So central government, to the extent, they, they have to <coughs> say that, oh, we need to learn about this. So they actually had some seminar. But how much they progress, we don't know. But this government, they start using it and they make it very efficient and very you know, active. Mm. So he has been considered. Next year will be the presidential re-election. So the two parties still you know, compete with each other, right? Now the social media's power supporting this mayor say, why don't you do that? Yeah, interesting. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.